and I think most of the people here kind of know what they're talking about. So my heart leans towards that this is correct. At least it's more than 50% of my heart says it's correct. So therefore I'm praying that direction. Okay? So either certainty that this is the right direction or غلبت الظن. So you have to find out to the extent, you can't just, oh, I'm going to pray any way I like. No, you work out, well, the sun's over there, so I guess, I guess I should have that behind my right shoulder. The sun's there, so it's this way. Yeah, I'm about 60% certain it's this way. So I pray this way. Am I right? No. Mecca's that way, by the way. Am I right? No. Is my prayer valid? Yes. Why? Because I prayed with ghalabit al-dhan. I did the ishtihad, I tried my best, and I prayed to the place that I thought was Mecca. If I just prayed that way, without doing that ishtihad, without making that effort, would my salah be valid? No, it wouldn't. Because I didn't make the effort to find out where the Qibla was. So it has to be bil yaqeen or bi ghalabat al With certainty or... Uh, can somebody help me with the ghalabat al I, I translate it when I translate it in the text. Overwhelming supposition was the wording, uh, wording I used. Sounds a bit cumbersome. But do you understand what it means? Okay. Now, right, I'll give you an example. There's one place, a prayer place you may attend here. A place called Al-Mizan. It's a very nice place, has a prayer prayer hall, and the Qibla, or the, the lines, are all marked so that they can fit the maximum number of people into the prayer hall. Because the Qibla is in this direction, so they put the lines like this, so they can fit lots of people in. But the Qibla is actually this way. Now why do they pray this way? So they can fit more people in. Is that valid? According to Imam Shafi, it's not because you have to pray with Yaqeen that you're praying to Mecca. <laughs> However, according to Abu Hanifa, you have to pray and get within 45 degrees correctness. 45 either way. So if I pray anywhere within this direction, I'm correct. According to Imam, Shaf, Imam Abu Hanifa. And they take that opinion. So once I prayed there and I stood and facing the Qibla, and they said, no, Qibla's that way. I said, it ain't that way. This is Mecca. They said, no, this is the way we pray. I said, you pray any way you like. I pray to Mecca. And then I called the Akama, and then they, whoever prayed behind me, prayed behind me. Because I'm not praying the direction that they tell me. Why? Because I pray with Yaqeen, or Ghalabat al dhan Otherwise, it's not valid. Because if I pray knowing this is the wrong direction, Salah is invalid. Okay, now, we, now we've got a problem. Now we're praying outside. They lock the mosque. Sometimes you can't get in. Okay, so we come along to the mosque. And I calculate it's this way. So with ghalabat al or yaqeen, I pray this way. But you say, no, you're wrong. We always pray that way, towards the, the union. Huh? We always pray towards the union bar. Okay? And I'm going to pray towards the union bar. And I say, you pray any way you like. I'm praying this way. So I pray this way. Is my salah valid? I prayed according to Ghalab al and my salah is valid. He prayed this way, towards the union bar. Is his salah valid? Yes, because he actually prayed the right direction. Both prayers were valid, but we prayed in the opposite direction. See how kind Allah is? If you understand fiqh, you will understand how kind he is. Right? That's not really going to cause you many problems, hopefully. Most mosques pray towards Mecca. And if they're Hanafi mosques, they pray nearly towards Mecca. If they're Maliki mosques, as long as you don't pray in the wrong direction. So if you pray this way, it's still valid. But if you pray this way, it's invalid. Okay, it's 180 degrees. I love him, I'm Malik. <laughs> right, fasting in summer, oh, is long. What else can I say? Uh, the Fajr time doesn't appear again. Like I said with Isha, the Fajr doesn't appear either. So again, you have to calculate backwards. And the way you calculate backwards is either where would it be at 15 degrees? Where would the sun, where, what time would the sun under normal circumstances have written on 15 degrees below the horizon? 
Do you understand what I mean by that? So here's the horizon. Sun moves or appears to move like this. And then it disappears. You can't see it. And then it reappears. When it's 15 degrees below the horizon, what time would that be? Or what time would it be at 18 degrees? And these are the two main opinions. And if it didn't appear ever for the whole of the summer, then what do you do? You can do either Akrab al Makan, which is the closest place, or Akrab al Zaman, the closest time. When did it last appear? <clears throat> And the last time it appeared in the summer, before it disappears, is something like May the 14th at 1.33 p.m., 1.33 a.m. So if you look at Glasgow Central Mosque, for the whole of the summer, it's 1.33 a.m. Do you understand why? Akrab al-Zaman. So when it comes to fasting, you're going to have loads and loads of timetables. Do you want me to tell you what I do? I take the shortest. <laughs> I'm not telling you you have to take the shortest. I'm not, I'm not a fakhi. I'm not one that can tell you these things. But I take the shortest. Um, the last point on here, alhamdulillah, I'll finish with this, is shaking hands with non-mahram. That's the seventh, seventh question. I can tell you what the kolum mutamid is. Is a kolum mutamid is it's not permitted. And the reason why is there's a hadith where the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says it would be better that you were hit with an iron bar than to touch a non-mahram. It would be better for you to be hit with an iron bar than to touch a non-mahram. That is the, the way that most people have been taught who have studied the Shafi Madhav. So, generally speaking, in Malaysia, um, that's what most of the, the madrasas will teach you. Is there any difference in the West? I don't know. I can only give you one example from my experience. And I'm not, I'm not making an, a, a judgment or opinion. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just telling you something that I observed. I was quite young. I moved to London. I started working in a Muslim school. And we had two uh, people who were working there, Muslim sort of elders. One was a man called Sheikh Mahmoud Galal, one of my teachers, who was an Azhari alim and was formerly the Imam of Central Mosque in London. Very beautiful very learned man, half his Quran, half his many hadith, MA in Islamic studies from Al-Azhar, you know, top grade alim. And the other guy was another beautiful, wonderful man with a really long beard, very muttaqi, very, very good, you know, you could see the man is a man of prayer. Not necessarily a man of knowledge, but a man of prayer, a man of fear, you know, he had taqwa, you know, he was scared to disobey Allah. And I remember, I was just, I was just a kid, um, and and this lady came into the into the school from the media, and she came to interview some Islamic people about Islamic stuff. So she came in, and she, this was a long time ago. I just I was a kid, or not kid, I was about twenty. So she came and she put her hand out to greet the imam, the the, imam, the, the head teacher, and he just looked at her. <laughs> And she started to cry. And I was thinking, what should I do? My natural instinct is to give her a hug. Sorry, I'm just, I was brought up in, in not, I wasn't brought up in Malaysia, all right? <laughs> I didn't learn all that Islamic stuff. But I know I'm not supposed to give her a hug. That's kind of haram. So, but what should I do? And I really didn't know what to do. I didn't give her a hug. <laughs> but I didn't know what to do other than say can I make you a cup of tea <laughs> kind of came out can I make you a cup of tea <laughs> and she says okay I said the kitchen's this way I was thinking what am I going to do now I'll make a cup of tea and then and then and then Sheikh Mahmoud came in the Egyptian Sheikh and he said Salam alaikum my name's Sheikh Mahmoud. <laughs> and then she took his hand and she says, and who are you? He says, I'm the Imam. And then she started getting a bit confused. And I says, here's your tea. And then she looked at me. 
and she could see in my eyes I wanted to give her a hug. <laughs> but she knew it was haram, so she didn't. And then she sat down and she talked. And I actually learned a lot from that incident. I don't go around giving girls hugs, even if they are crying. I do make people tea quite often. And I don't know what I would have done now if that same thing happened. I don't know. That's why I don't have an answer. I think, I think, I haven't faced this, I think I probably would have done what Sheikh Mahmoud did. I think. But I don't know yet. Right, what relevance has that got to do? You make your own decisions about what, because you, you've got to deal with your Lord, Yom al Qiyamah. Fortunately, I haven't had to make too many of those decisions. But there is a time when you might have to make this decision, is on New Year. Scottish culture is different to English culture. There's one thing that is very, very good about Scottish, well, there's many things about it, but there's one thing that's really very beautiful, is when it comes to New Year, everybody sings a song called Old Lang Syne. Old Lang Syne means Let's forget what's gone on in the past. Start again. Old Lang Syne means that's all gone. It's Old Lang Syne. And then they hug or shake hands. And then they start to fight each other. <laughs> no, no, they don't actually. Actually, it's very quite beautiful. But usually they get drunk. The people in Scotland have a... There's more people drink in England, in Scotland than many other places. I try to put it as politely. But what I used to like about living in, in London is you could always tell the Scottish drunks and the Irish drunks because they weren't as nasty as the English drunks. And it wasn't until I came to Scotland that I realised that's quite normal because half the people I work with are drunk all the time. So they're kind of almost always drunk and they don't really get drunk, drunk and get aggressive. But when it comes to old, at this point, it's quite important to them that, that you put everything behind you. And if they put out your ha their hands on that, night, on that night, or you're down at George Square with all the other drunks, <laughs> it's a great atmosphere. But the only problem is, is there's a lot of drunk people, and there's a lot of people that like to hug. And when the bells go and everyone sang Old Lang Syne, you're expected to hug everybody. And you're expected to shake hands with everybody. And if you don't, it's like, let's put everything behind me. <laughs> now that's your decision, whether you want to go down there for New Year's Eve. I don't. Personally, I watch it on the television. And then just pretend I was there. <laughs> okay? That's all I've got for those seven, seven things. I probably run out of time ages ago, but sorry, there were seven questions. Do we still have time for our questions and answers? Yeah. So I'll hand it over to you. Well, I'll hand it over to the moderator. Any questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, could you please explain more about Jama Tamam? Jama Tamam. Tamam. Tamam? Yeah. Sorry, did I Jama? Jama Jama Tamam. Oh, Jama. 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 Okay, okay. I'll just take this. Jama Tamam and Jama. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, no problem. Sorry. I have to get my ear back into 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 gear. I've, I've, I haven't been teaching for a while. I took a like a few months off, and so uh, I haven't uh, spoken to anybody bigger than him. For, <laughs> <laughs> he's been my best pal for about four months, just me and him most of the time. And now his mother's a bit better, so she might be here later. Um, so that's why when some people say Islamic words, I sometimes don't always get them. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, Jam. When you when you when you combine the prayers. What it means is to bring the Asr prayer into the into the Dhuhr prayer or the Dhuhr prayer into the Asr prayer. These, you can't join any prayer except Dhuhr and Asr and Maghrib and Isha. You can't do Asr and Maghrib. And the conditions are that you have a Udhr. 
You have a legitimate reason to combine the prayer. And the, the combining of the prayer is different to qasr. Qasr means to shorten. So sometimes you shorten to two rak'ah and you combine. So say for example, I'm traveling to Inverness for the day. If I'm traveling to Inverness or um, Aberdeen, for example, this is more than 48 miles. By the way, Edinburgh is only 48 miles. So be careful when you go to Edinburgh. Don't consider Edinburgh as, a, as a, an, uh, 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 always as a being a, another city. It's, it's not always far enough to travel as a traveler. So therefore, you, it's, not an other, it's not a legitimate, always a legitimate reason as a traveler. So I'm a traveler, I'm going to Inverness or Aberdeen. So at some point, I will come short of my prayer. Dhar to two and Asr to two. Now, if I'm traveling all the way to Aberdeen and I'm leaving about now, Dhuhr hasn't come in yet. So I can't pray Dhuhr now. By the time Dhuhr comes in, I'll be just past Cumbernault. The Cumbernault on the M80. About 20 minutes from now, I'll be on my way. Cumbernault, there is a mosque, but they don't pray till 2 o'clock. I can get off the motorway, take me another 15 minutes, go pray, and then get back onto the motorway. Or I can just keep going. By the time I get to um, Aberdeen, it should still be Dhuhr time. It should still be Dhuhr time. But it might not. So what should I do? Wait till Dhuhr comes in, and then decide whether I'm going to do Dhuhr or not. Or just wait till I get there and see what the time is. If I get there and Dhuhr is in, still in, I'll do Dhuhr. And if I want to bring Asr forward, I can bring Asr forward. But this would be probably with Qasr. Because Allah gave it as a Rukhsa. He gave us the opportunity to shorten the prayer. Okay, so I'll do Dhur and Asr, Jam, together. So this is one Mas'ala. Jam is one Mas'ala. Combining them is one Mas'ala. Qasr is another Mas'ala. So I could do Jam without Qasr. So I could do four and four. Or I could do Qasr without Jam. I could do Dhuhr in Dhuhr time and Asr in Asr time. Now why would I want to do that? It's because I was traveling with my good friend who happens to be a Pakistani brother called Hamza. And he's a Hanafi. And they don't do Jam. They do Qasr but not Jam. So I want to pray with him. He's my pal. So we pray Dhuhr to Raka'ah. Uh, qasr, not jam. And then we wait an hour, we pray asr. Qasr, asr. <laughs> Shortened. And so there, that's qasr. Without jam. Right, can you do jam without qasr, which is really the question you're asking? And the answer is yes, if you have a legitimate reason. A legitimate reason, for example, the one I gave to Sayyid Abdullah, was to do, he's, he's going into brain surgery. But he's a big guy. He's an important guy. So he can tell them the surgery will start at 1.30, not 1.15. If you're there at 1.15, I don't cut open anybody's brains until 1.30. And they say, let big. Well, they don't. They just kind of shiver because he doesn't really tell people off. But when he does, don't mess with him. Because he'll say 1.30, not 1.15. Why? Because he's still, he's still doing his Dhuhr Salah. He'll do his Dhuhr Salah and he'll do his Asr Salah. But he's not traveling. So he can't do Qasr. But you're asking, can you do Jam in Tamam? Complete? Yes, he can. So what does he do? He does four Dhuhr, four Asr, and then he goes into brain surgery. And he carries on his brain surgery until that person recovers or dies. That's his job. And it might not be until 10 o'clock at night. So what does he do? As soon as he's finished, he's straight to do his wudu, and he does his Maghrib, Isha, Salat al shukr That's his, that's his tertib. Three rak'ah, Maghrib. Four rak'ah, Isha. Two rak'ah, Salat al shukr that's, his, that's how he will do it. So that's how you do, because he's not got the, he's got reason to do jam, combining the prayer, but not Qasr. So what's this based on? The hadith of the rain? 
How many rakaat did they do? They did four and four. So that's why, based on this, the answer is that you do four and four. So it's jam with tamam, complete. Is that, is that clear? Maybe she asked about, uh, because last week we went to outing day, and yeah, you're from Edinburgh, right? Edinburgh. Ah, okay. And we went to Highlands, and then uh, on Maghrib and Asia, one of the uh, facilitators asked uh, them to do uh, Cause, at, uh, Edinburgh, is it? Uh, okay, or, okay yeah. when you got back, you mean? Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's a very good point. So now you're no longer a traveller. But you have a other, you were a traveller. So you can do jam, but you can't do qasr because you're not a traveller. So you'll be like Sayyid Abdullah. So you do th three Maghrib and four Aisha. So where did you actually come from? Which direction? Uh, from Highlands. From the Highlands. Maghrib, yeah. So you left, so, so you're coming down Stirling. Yeah. Right, if you're coming down the M90 towards Edinburgh and you just decide I'm going to stop at a service station just before Edinburgh, mm -hmm. near the airport for example, there's a service station there, um, and you just stop there, it's not in Edinburgh yet. If you pray there, you could have done Qasr prayer. You could have done three and two. But once you've entered into the city of Edinburgh, then you have to do three and four. And you should pray your prayer as soon as you get there. Don't leave it till later. So, because your other, your, your legitimate reason is going to disappear. Oh, let me just have a pizza. Oh, let me just watch Friends. Uh, oh, no, let me just uh, do the dishes. Oh, no, I'll, I'll just uh, make a few phone calls. And then you do your solo. Oh, that, that's not a really legitimate reason. If you just come in, I've just come from my journey, I'm just going to pray. Right. Okay, I'm really, really hungry. I really need that pizza. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to stand and pray. Okay, eat your pizza. When you've had enough, then you pray. But don't. The phone calls are the rest of it. So that's how you, how, how you should have done it. Which I'm sh that's what you did, isn't it? Yeah. Which is correct. Because I wouldn't have stopped at that, that service station. Because McDonald's is not really a nice place to pray. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? I don't need the way. I've got a loud voice. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> so the suffer is within the 48 mile proximity from your whole town. As soon as you're in, you're not a musafir anymore. You have to pray yeah. normal. Yeah. Okay. Right, the definition of, a, of your city, because uh, say for example, you're leaving from, I, I, was, I said Cumbernauld. Now, is, I'm living in Glasgow, is Cumbernauld considered to be a journey? It's less than 48 miles. It's only 21 miles. Can I do Kosovo there? If, if I'm traveling to Aberdeen, I can. Why? Because I've left Glasgow and I'm traveling to Aberdeen. What's this based on? Is when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam traveled south and he passed through Cuba. He prayed Qasr in Cuba. He shortened his prayer in Cuba, which is not 48 miles yet. And so most of the scholars have understood that if the journey is more than 48 miles, as soon as you've left the city, you can, you can, um, you can shorten. The only slight problem you're gonna have in Glasgow is, is the airport part of Glasgow? Because what defines a break in the city means something which is distinctly not city. Previously, if you, were li if you lived in Glasgow, say 20 years ago, you left Glasgow, you got onto the M8, and there were fields. And then you got to the airport, you're at the airport. But now, you leave Glasgow, you've got Brayhead on one side, Silverburn on the other side. Then you've got the, um, this industrial estate, you've got, so now I don't know it's that clear anymore. Because before, the airport was another place. Now I'm not sure, and that's why I would never shorten my prayer in Glasgow Airport, even if I was flying to Malaysia. Because it's, I would still think it's part of, part of Glasgow. However, if I was flying to Malaysia from Edinburgh, I would shorten in Edinburgh, even though it's less than 48 miles. Because if you drive down the M8, it's very clear, this isn't Glasgow anymore. You can tell by the cows. Yeah? Okay, there's another question. Assalamu um, alaikum. Um, how do you pray on trains? Do you stand up and uh, look at the Qibla like, before you leave? Uh, that's the first question. And the second is, um, if you live in halls, 
what can you use the cutlery in the kitchen? Can you use all of them, like the Excellent. microwave? Yeah. Excellent question. This is why I like questions and answers. They always get people come up with real practical things. The first one, <coughs> according to Imam Shafi'i, the forward prayer has to face the Qibla. One of the conditions of the forward prayer is that you have to face the Qibla. So you can't just pray the way the train is going for a forward prayer. You need, according to Imam Shafi'i, you need to find out which direction is the Qibla. So if you're heading to London, from Glasgow or from Edinburgh, you should be heading south. So, if I was to pray on the train, I would sit facing the way the driver's going. Why? Because if that's south, then southeast is just over there. So all I need to do is just turn this way. Long. Face this direction. And I'm facing the Qibla. Okay? Right. I was sitting. Is it valid to sit? It's valid to sit if you can't stand. It's valid to sit if you can't stand. Most trains, most trains, you should be able to stand safely on most trains. Not all trains, and not all the time. So whether you stand or you sit would be based on your circumstances. Whether you can, because some people can stand, some people can't stand. And some people might feel that the balance of the train might become problematic. Some people, they won't stand because the only place to stand would be blocking the path. So, you know, you have to look at the situation on that train, whether you stand or you sit. But according to the forward prayer, according to the Imam Shafi, the forward prayer should face the Qibla. The Sunnah prayer, you pray anywhere, any direction you like. As a Musafir, as a, tra as a traveler, a Rakib, the person is actually, just pray any direction. So, um, for example, if I've prayed my Fajr prayer, and then I'm on a train, and I'm praying my Duha, midday prayer, Sunnah prayer, just pray the direction that they, we're going, and I, then I would never stand. Not would never stand, but it'd be rare that I'd stand and block the path. But for the forward prayer, I might try and find a space to pray, and if I couldn't, I'd just pray sitting. Yeah. Okay, that's the first question. Second question about the cutlery. The cutlery has to be clean, and that's, that's really all that, that matters. And if you've cleaned it sufficiently well um, from the person that's using it before you, then it should be no, there should be no traces of, there shouldn't be any cross-contamination. Um, if it's being shared and you fear cross-contamination, then the best thing is to buy your own. But um, hopefully you can avoid cross-contamination just by cleaning it you know, thoroughly. It, shouldn't, it, shouldn't, it doesn't become nedges, so to speak doesn't become impure just because somebody's been cooking, you know, their bacon sandwiches. Um, you know, that, so don't worry too much about that. Just give it a good clean and you, you should be fine. Okay. Um, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. My name is Alma. Um, I'm asking about... Um, if we were to travel from Malaysia to Glasgow, um, and then the time, the, the prayer time will will change. So, which prayer time should we adhere to? I mean, is it is it based from where we're from or the place that we we are the, on the, on the flight? I was really scared someone was going to ask me about planes after you mentioned <laughs> train. I thought, let me answer the train. I hope nobody asks about planes. <laughs> Because there's two parts to the, the thing about the plane. One is it's in the air. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and the second is all the things that we were talking about with the, 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 the train. So the question of the Qibla is the same. The question of the standing and sitting is the same. If you're traveling from Malaysia, most good airlines will have some space for you to pray. And most good airlines will be able to identify that they're doing praying it's okay um, and the very good airlines like Emirates will have the Qibla all marked for you um, when it comes to the prayer time which is the question you're really asking you should you have to pray according to the point that you're in which means that you really really need to think out your journey if you really want to get the prayer on time so usually when I travel from Malaysia 
I usually take the, the 11 o'clock flight, KLM, um, which means I've prayed my Isha, um, Maghrib and Isha before I've left. So I work out when will the Fajr appear. It will prob it usually appears just over Bombay. Uh, when I'm traveling at 11 o'clock, it will just be round about that time. Uh, and you can usually see it on the flight path. It actually shows you where the sun, where the daytime and the nighttime is. So you can probably calculate where it's going to be. And you can usually see. So what happens when it gets to Bombay, if I'm still awake, I pray, and then I go to sleep. Sometimes I've fallen asleep before that time and I've slept through that one hour and I've missed my Fajr prayer and not prayed until I got to Amsterdam. Um, actually, no, the 11 o'clock flight lands at 7 o'clock in the morning in Amsterdam. So in the winter, I can actually pray in Amsterdam. In the summer, I have to pray somewhere on the way because I remember actually taking that same flight, landing and then rushing straight to make wudu and pray on Amsterdam airport but that's when Fajr was due was when I got to Amsterdam or when we passed Bombay depending on what month it is so you need to calculate before you leave right the question about why I says it's up in the air is actually there are some scholars who say the prayer in the air isn't valid yeah, I hear that too. so what you do is you pray because you have to but when you land or sometimes after land you re repeat the prayer so that on that particular flight, where I, I'm traveling the 11 hours to Amsterdam, then I'll, if I prayed in Bombay, I pray again when I get to Amsterdam. So that's how, how I would do it, flying from Malaysia. Or I will take, uh, as my sheikh taught me, uh, just fly Emirates. <laughs> <laughs> he has a loyalty card with Emirates. <laughs> and uh, it seems, I mean, he, he, tra he travels that flight so often from KL to... to um, uh, Dubai, he never prays on the air, on the aeroplane because you know his people book the the flight so that he lands. Uh, he doesn't miss any prayers wherever wherever he goes. It's just he's got people to do it. But for poor people like me, I have to. So, so that's the answer. So where you are is. The answer. Is there any such thing as qada? I mean, if qada. you were to miss it, salah, I mean. Qada is when you've missed it, yeah. not when you want to miss it. <laughs> Qada is if you've missed it, then you should. Qada means payback. Qada literally means payback. So if um, you're asleep, you pray when you wake up because you're not. You can't pray when you're asleep. First of all, it's not valid, and, and second is you're not responsible. You, you, you're not going to be taken to account. So if you die in that sleep, you won't be held responsible for the prayer you missed while you were asleep. So while I was on the plane, I won't. I missed Bombay. I was really tired. You know, flying to, has, has anyone ever flown to KL for the weekend? You know, I fly here, take the, fi the five o'clock flight, finish my work there on Friday, fly out on Friday night via Amsterdam, get there on Saturday, spend Saturday night there and fly back Sunday to come straight back to work. It's tiring. So I missed my prayer. Okay, I missed my Fajr prayer, but I got it when I landed. And I just hoped that I didn't die between... Bombay and Amsterdam. Alhamdulillah, Allah accepted my prayer and I didn't die. So, Qada is when you've missed something and you have to pay it back. So, if um, I owe you, if I if I need money for the meter, and I say, can I give, can could, could I borrow borrow a pound off you? If I say, can I borrow a pound off you? He says, yes, you, I'm lending you a pound. That means I have to pay it back. Yeah, but you live in Ed Edinburgh. I'm not going to see you again. So, does that mean I never have to pay it back? Of course I have to pay it back. When I next see her, I have to pay it back. Or I have to say, excuse me, could you forgive me? The pound that you gave me. She said, what pound? She can't even remember. But it's still a, I still have to do qada of the day. I have to still pay that debt. Okay? So you need to pay every debt that's owed. Right? There is a fit question related to that. I don't know if that's what you're asking. Is if you've missed your prayers, as a child, for example, not as a child, as an adult. There are people that have missed their prayers because maybe they weren't so focused on the deen that they didn't start praying till they were 20, for example. But they were responsible for their prayers at 16 or 12. So they've got eight years of prayer. 
So do they need to do qadha for those eight years? And the answer is yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked you to pray, told you to pray, and therefore you have to pray. If you've missed it, you still have to pay him back what you've missed. So how do you do this? What you do is that you make a plan. Eight years of prayer, that's going to take me at least eight years. It's going to take me at least eight years. So what I'm going to do is every time I pray, I'm going to do double. I do one dhuhr, one asr, one maghrib, one isham every day. And there's one sister I know, she counts every day. She doesn't do dhuhr with dhuhr. She just, when it comes to the night prayer, after she's finished isha, she does one whole day of prayer. And then one day hold, and then after one year, she's completed one year of prayers. And it takes her about 20 minutes, she says, every day. Every day, 20 minutes, she's made up a year's worth of prayer in a year. So she knew that she had three and a half years to do. Three and a half years later, she's paid it all back. What would have happened if she died before the three years was up? Accepted. Inshallah, I love you, man. No, I'm just taking the principle of that guy that killed 99. Ah, I told you I love you, man. <laughs> Why? Because I think that's what Allah would have said. You know, you're making an effort, but if he said pray, and you didn't pray, and you didn't make an effort to pay him back, and you didn't even try, and you said, nah, it's all right. Allah's kind. I think you're taking a risk. I think it's best to say, yeah, Allah's kind, but I'm still going to try. And that's what you should do. And that's the correct way to do it. And Allah knows best. Anyone else? Well, everybody hungry? <laughs> okay, time for makan? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is uh, it for, for the lecture and a lot of uh, things that we learn, right, uh, for this session, Alhamdulillah. And may Allah bless you, Sheikh, and also all of us, inshallah. So, uh, right now we are in the rest and for makan and uh, salat zuhur. So, everyone can take uh, the lunch um, at the back. And who who who's still not, <laughs> who's still uh, not uh, registered, uh, maybe can see...